I'm Lynn Martell with Loma Linda University Medical Center and Journey of Hope. I want to welcome you to another edition of our program here. It's a program where we interview former patients, people that have been impacted by the healing ministry of Loma Linda University Medical Center. We have people coming from around the world, people that have uh, experienced some type of a medical tragedy, or a trauma, or cancer. Our patient today is Michael Long, a cancer survivor, an energetic father of two, uh, involved in a very interesting uh, business. And uh, I want to welcome you to our program here, Michael. And thank you. Michael's it's great from to be here. Ashburn, Virginia. And Michael, I want to learn a little bit about your background. We have people from around the world that are watching on uh, satellite, and uh, I know you have something to do with satellites. But before we talk about that, tell us where you're from, a little bit about your background. Where I'm from, uh, uh, my father was in the Army. Um, uh, my mother was a naturalized U.S. citizen, German. Uh, I was born in France and grew up in Germany until I was 10. So you've been the great traveling around from very early on then. Yeah, in fact, as my father got posted around, we traveled there uh, while he was doing his tours in Southeast Asia. Um, I lived in Germany on the economy. So I'd go and I'd be an American kid in the morning and a German kid in the afternoon. And that was truly a great experience. So did you learn another language then? I do. I speak German. You speak German. Okay. I speak a little bit of French too. All right. But and no. then you ended up coming here to the United States. And where were you raised uh, here in the United States? Yeah, uh, my father was assigned to uh, Fort Lee in Petersburg, Virginia. And I went to uh, high school there. I uh, went to uh, Catholic high school and went on to the University of Virginia, where I graduated with a degree in economics and German. And, okay, so what, at that point, what was your plan in life? What did you want to do when you took uh, economics and German? Uh, well, the economics and German was actually something I decided to do after I realized that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in a chemistry lab. Okay. So uh, uh, economics uh, seemed like a very good and broad-based application. And uh, as I started to study it, I became more and more interested in it. And... Uh, uh, it seemed like a great foundation to do so many different things. And uh, I uh, ended up c completing a double major my last two years there in economics and German. And then I went and uh, decided to go into the area of uh, contracting and uh, went to work for the US government as an intern uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, ended up uh, in St. Louis for a year and a half uh, buying parts for UH-60 helicopters, supporting the rapid deployment force. Um, in fact, the, uh, uh, the helicopter that shot up that speedboat that was lying mines in the Persian Gulf was one of mine. Oh, well, was it really? It was. So uh, uh, then I went on to work on the Pershing-2 missile program in Huntsville, Alabama. And from there, I went up to the Office of Naval Research. From there, I made the leap into private industry, and I worked for a company called E-Systems for a few years, and then a uh, woman came into my office that I knew from work who's, who said, uh, Michael, I think you need to go look elsewhere. Give me, your give me your resume. She gave it to her husband, Brian, who was a vice president with a company called Orbital Sciences Corporation. Next thing you know, I'm working in the space industry, and that's pretty much where I've been since that time. So now, and then what are you doing now? I mean, you're launching something. Well, yeah, uh, what we do right now is we actually uh, launch commercial communication satellites on a Russian rocket called the Proton, which is a name which rings, has a certain resonance with it's you. Called, called the Proton. That's right. And uh, we launched that from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where Yuri Gagarin went into space. And I mean, you're doing this on a continual basis, or? Yep, I, uh, that's uh, that's. I work on the business side. I work with a great group of people at ILS, and uh, who ILS. Now that's International Launch Services. Okay. That's the company I, I work for. A great group of people who were very supportive of me when I was here at Loma Linda, and in fact, uh, they ended up uh, asking me constantly for updates. They also kind of uh, noted the. Uh, irony, if you want to call it, that uh, there were protons being shot into my head, and they wanted to make sure they were small ones, not the big ones that I use. <laughs> and uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, it was really great to have that link. Um, they, in fact, we have a picture of the proton rocket hanging in the fixed beam room. Do you really? At Loma Linda. And uh, uh, in the, somewhere in the, all that process, I also uh, completed my master's in business from George Mason University. And uh, now I work, uh, and what we do is we 
propose and negotiate and sell launch services to launch these satellites for customers around the world. Um, not uh, 10 days ago, I was in Taiwan. Earlier in the year, I was in Dubai. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to get some chances to see some of the uh, finer conference rooms around the world. I imagine you're traveling all around the world. Well, Michael, several years ago, I think it's about five now, uh, you made a sobering discovery. Why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, I did. Uh, in fact, it's what I'll call round one. Um, after three successive trips to India, my father being diagnosed with cancer, I was traveling back and forth to Texas. What type of cancer did he have? He had lung cancer. He had a very aggressive cancer. form of small cell carcinoma okay. tied to Agent Orange. And I imagine he went rather quickly. He did, okay. uh, two and a half months. Okay. And it was really very difficult to see. I imagine it was. Um, so you had, you had this kind of a family background then. I did, and, uh, uh, and of course all this was on top of my regular work, um, traveling about uh, places in the world and uh, doing things of that nature. So needless to say, I was a little tired. Um, and in fact, uh, as I continued to press on, I kept looking forward to this one special week uh, that I spend at the Outer Banks of North Carolina every summer. And I just knew that if I could make it to that week, then I would be able to rest and get a little bit better. So you were, you were just, you were getting tired and exhausted, and it was more than just being tired from traveling, but you right. didn't know it at that point. That's true, and I've always been a very physically, I mean, fatigue. Yeah. I've, been, I've always been a very physically strong person. And I was able to just will my way through it and push my way through it and use my physical strength. And that ended up being a disservice to me. Uh, I then... Uh, you ignored certain things. Yeah, I, I overlooked them because I attributed them to all these other things that were going on, which in retrospect, I would probably have made, come to the same conclusion, but my physical strength did not serve me well in this case. And... Uh, you just kind of kept pushing yourself. I did. And then, well, ignoring, well, ignoring signs and, and denying the, yes. that it's uh, more than what it really is. That's right. And uh, uh, I went to the Outer Banks for a week, which is down in Carolina. And the Outer, yeah, that's right. It's on the one of the beaches in North Carolina. And uh, I didn't feel the slightest bit rested when after that week. Then I went on a 13-day trip to Tokyo and Seoul which just absolutely devastated me. And, totally uh, depleted your, yes, any energy did, did that not, you might have had. Did not know how to, I would find my way up the stairs when I arrived home from that, that trip. Um, so needless to say, I thought it was appropriate to go and uh, go see a physician, which I did. Everything appeared to be normal. Blood pressure was good, breathing rate, EKG, you name it. Um, and they drew blood. Well, the next day I was on a, uh, I left the following evening for a trip to Toulouse, France. And somewhere I was en route, they got the blood report and found out that I was very anemic. So the orders came out, and I was immediately told to come around and, and come home. And I was ordered to go directly to the emergency room upon my arrival at Washington Dulles International Airport. So how did, I mean, how, you were on your way to France. How did you find this out? Uh, by walking into the hotel room, and the phone was ringing without anybody really knowing I was there. And I was told that, although it's uncertain why I needed to do so, I had to call home immediately. That would be in bold, uh, bold font, underlined. So this must have been quite a surprise. You're walking into a hotel and they don't even know you're, nobody knows Absolutely. you're there. You walk in and the phone is ringing. That's right. And you get the message, you've got to call. Uh, not only do I have to call, but they also, uh, my doctor also wanted to know if I was near a hospital. Of course, and that just kind of uh, raises the curiosity level well, just a I mean, little bit. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty clear that I was bleeding internally. Of course, the, um, the, uh, the cause was unknown, but I was uh, over 20% low on blood volume in my body. Already? And in fact, I, uh, my, my physician said that I really should be unconscious at this point. But uh, again, my physical strength enabled me to push through that. And ultimately, that's what was causing my, you know, in tr tremendous amount of fatigue. You've been bleeding for a period of time, and yeah. Yeah, the blood count was going down, and... And so, so I come so back you're in home. France, so yeah. you turn around then and turn around, uh, uh, get in a cab, go to the airport the next morning, stopping along the way, of course, to grab a couple of croissants because you can't go to France without yeah, eating some croissants. 
and uh, came home straight to the emergency room, transfusion, um, had a colonoscopy in which we discovered I had a tumor in my colon, which led to uh, uh, surgery, had a resection. Uh, the uh, tumor had grown outside the actual colon wall, had uh, grown to two of the lymph nodes, and uh, that led to chemotherapy for six months. And I ended up having the 5-FU protocol and uh, um, been following up ever since that time. And, you know, I thought I had dodged my bullet at that so point. So this was five years ago. And, right. And uh, you kind of overcame it. When you're hit with the words, you got cancer, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a terrifying experience. My first thought was, dear God, how can this happen? I haven't taught the girls everything I need to teach them yet and kind of the fear that uh, you, you might be leaving before you you Before your, my work is done. Before yes. your work is done. I think that's true for nearly everyone when they get, when they get the words and all of a sudden mortality, they're faced with their own mortality and hear the clock ticking. So you went through the chemo and you dodged the bullet. I did. And uh, with some great, great medical care, Dr. Rangapa Rajendra, his team of uh, nurses, absolutely fantastic. Had a fantastic surgeon, Russell McDowell, Cannot thank them enough. Absolutely top flight people in the medical field. And you went through how many months of chemo? Uh, six months. How about six so finished months. That in, finished that in May of 2004. Okay. And, you know, you're, you've overcome. You're going to be able to continue working with your daughters and, and, and training them and uh, mentoring them and, and watching them grow up. And then uh, what happened? Well, um, uh, the chemotherapy really took a little bit out of me, so my stamina was rather weak. You didn't recover as quickly as you thought you were going no, to? I, no, not, let's say not as fast as I had hoped I would. And as my energy started to come back, I started to play a little bit of soccer part-time in the fall. And uh, then the following uh, spring, I joined and, and knew that I would uh, go ahead and play full-time as a goalkeeper on my soccer team. Go Leesburg Fire. This is back in the D.C. area. Absolutely. I okay. uh, play with a great bunch of individuals there. Very international team, energetic team, really wonderful people. Um, and it really was a joy. We, would play, we played matches on Sunday, and it's something that you just can't wait to. <laughs> it's something to look forward to every week. So, so life is going, it's finally going better for you. It is, and then we have a match on the 2nd of July, 2006. And I wake up in the morning, the alarm goes off, and I'm seeing double. And I think... Uh, I think I'm not quite awake. I even went into the bathroom and put my head under the faucet in the bathtub and had cold water run over my head. And that didn't take care of it either. So needless to say, I was a little bit curious. I knew that there was something that was going to require some attention. Um, but I got dressed, went and played a match. We won. Good. And, uh, but made a note uh, that uh, as soon as the doctor's office is open in the morning, they're getting a phone call from me. No more putting things off like I did before. And uh, my primary care physician, uh, at this point it's uh, Dr. Holger Nolle, uh, German doctor. Um, he goes, looks at me, can't figure out uh, anything that's going wrong, sends me upstairs to see an ophthalmologist. Can't find anything wrong. That was on Monday the 3rd. Tuesday was the 4th. And isn't it amazing how these things you always happen? You remember these dates. Uh, how you remember these dates and, uh, and the exact times and, and they're embedded in your memory, right. memory in a way that uh, few things truly are. Right. And uh, so then I went to see a retina specialist on Wednesday. They couldn't ascertain any problem, and they suggested that I perhaps see a neuro-ophthalmologist. At this point, I took a step back and decided that there was an assumption being made that it was related to my eye that I was not comfortable with. So I went and started to locate a neurosurgeon. And uh, I wanted to see a neurosurgeon that day. And as you well know, that's usually pretty hard to do. So I let my fingers do the walking, so to speak, and found a neurosurgeon just an hour from my house. And it was Thursday afternoon. He saw me late after office hours. He was sufficiently concerned that he had somebody bumped from an MRI schedule the following morning and put me in their place. And I was told to bring the films over with a wet reading, and I did so. And ultimately then at 5.15 in the afternoon on Friday, I found out I had a tumor in my head. 
You had a, a, a second type of cancer. Yes. And what was it finally diagnosed as? Uh, well, we didn't fi get the diagnosis for quite some time because of its location. Its location was very problematic. Uh, it was in what's known as the pons, tucked in between the pituitary gland and the carotid artery. Difficult to reach. Virtually impossible, yes. In fact, you could not even do a biopsy because the risk was so great. Um, and uh, so since I knew such excellent physicians, I went to go see my oncologist, made sure I was there a half an hour before he opened up the office, sat down on the floor outside the office and waited for him. Told him what was going on. He thought for a few seconds and said, this is who you need to go see. And then I went to go see that uh, doctor uh, the following day, and that was July 12th, I think it was. And uh, um, they came I think up July 11th. July 11th, 12th. And then um, I remember what he said to me. He was, he looks at the x-rays and he says, boy, Rod sends me all the tough ones, doesn't he? And um, uh, he said, uh, I don't know if we can get to this. And I walked up to the x-rays and said, well, can't we go in through the nasal cavity and drill through that bone right there and get to it that way? He says, no, we can't do that. That's too hard. And uh, you'll hear about that again in just a second. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, he told me that 80% uh, of the brain we can get to rather easily, 10% with substantial morbidity, and 10% we can't get to. And he didn't know which of the two 10% I was in. That was a bad day. That, that, that was, was a very bad day. Bad day. Um, so uh, I called my boss, told him I wouldn't be in for the rest of the day, and went home and cried like a baby. And then I pulled myself together, because he had also said, uh, but we haven't lost hope. There's a new doctor who just moved down here. I heard he's great in this area. So uh, uh, Chandra Brawley carried my films around with him, got a hold of Joe Watson, told him what the deal was, and Joe felt he could get to it. Joe calls me Thursday afternoon, says, hi, this is Joe Watson. Chandra Brawley spoke to me. Maybe you can come in so we can talk. And uh, within five minutes of my meeting Joe Watson, uh, I knew I was going to be okay. You had a sense that there was, you know, it wasn't the end. True. Well, you know, I had been through a dark tunnel already. Sure. And uh, the biggest concern was if nothing could be done, because at that point uh, the, the end game was fairly well cast in stone. And, uh, but Joe, uh, uh, I just felt so reassured. Gave you some hope. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then it was a matter of going through the surgery uh, which I did the following Wednesday, as soon as space opened up. And uh, sure enough, and he tells me he's uh, going in through my na nasal cavity, cutting open the sinus, <laughs> and drilling through the clivus the very, the very thing that you had kind of suggested. Right. So then you had the surgery. When did you come to Loma Linda? Well, first of all, I had to wait for the pathology. One day goes by, two, three, four, week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. Mm. After 37 days, we were I finally able to get a pathology of this thing. And that was done by the chief of uh, pathology at Johns Hopkins. And it was called a chondrosarcoma, a tumor which is normally found on the long bones and is very rare and is even more rare to have in the head. Is that right? And so completely unrelated to my prior cancer. And uh, uh, Joe says again, why don't you come in so we can talk about alternatives? And I go and I talk to him and he says, uh, you know, you're probably going to need some kind of radiation. We couldn't get all the tumor, of course, because some of it was tucked behind the carotid. And you probably want to look into some kind of radiation. Maybe you might be a good candidate for proton radiation. And I remember him saying, I know they do that at Loma Linda and maybe some other places. So I go home and start researching on the internet and uh, start finding out about proton, about what it means, what it is. I read a paper ring, written by Dr. Slater. Talks about the effectivity of proton, particularly with my type of diagnosis. Its effectivity. I was really taken by the fact that it greatly reduced side effects. The fact that the beam does not traverse the entire body at that point and stops effectively at the tumor, depositing its energy right there. Destroying the tumor. That's right. Uh, you can deposit more energy there. You don't affect the uh, portion of the body because you're only on the entry side. There's no exit path for the radiation. 
or they're like, unlike other treatment modalities. And uh, it was at that point, I was hooked. I, okay, proton, that's it. So the next question is where to go? And I started looking up. Uh, Loma Linda was, uh, I read about it, treated one fourth of the world's totals. Thought, well, that's pretty impressive. I uh, also knew they had it at uh, uh, Mass General and uh, University of Indiana, but I didn't, they weren't, I couldn't learn enough about them in such a short time, and I wasn't really inspired by what I found. And uh, MD Anderson, one of the greatest cancer treatment facilities in the world, uh, but they had just come online. And I remember, I think I told my brother, I said, I don't go to a restaurant when it, right when it opens. And I don't think I want to trust this. Not that they don't do a great job. Sure. And, and I know they do. Yeah, but, but the they were just getting started and you didn't want to be one of the early patients. Absolutely. Uh, I tried to avoid being the guinea pig whenever possible. And, uh, but fundamentally, it really came back to the fact that Loma Linda had treated so many patients that the man who is ultimately responsible for proton therapy in a clinical setting is right here. Right. And that's where it all started, right? That's here. right. And so it really was a no-brainer. And so I called and ended up getting on the schedule, flew out here. And once I flew out here, any doubts that I had were immediately allayed uh, because I went down uh, to the first uh, level and I just started meeting people down there. And, you know, you're thinking that this, something's wrong here. There's too many happy people here. And it really is infectious when you're down there. People were so positive. The staff was just unbelievable. Um, and uh, so reassuring, so confident, so friendly. You know, we have an undergirding philosophy to yeah. make man whole. Absolutely. Mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We're going to take a look at a couple okay. of pictures, and you can kind of guide us through here, and then we're going to come back and talk about how this cancer made an impact upon you. What's our first, you know, uh, we kind of talk about this. It's my daughter, Mackenzie. Yeah. She's, uh, she was 11 years old when we took that picture. She's 12 now. And that is her beaming personality coming through right there. Yeah. And she was of great support to me. And she is. She's, I can lean on her. And she is just a fantastic human being, as well as a great student, great swimmer. This is my other daughter, Alexandra, two years younger. Brilliant girl, also a wonderful human being, soccer player. Um, great student is going to be representing uh, uh, her school, hopefully in, in the spelling bee. Really, you told that's me about a, one of your daughters uh, was recently appointed to be an ambassador. Yeah, that's Mackenzie, the one that's on the left in this picture. Mackenzie is a very strong girl physically. Uh, she used to take pride when she was younger that she was the only person who could pick up each of the pe everybody in her class. <laughs> you know, not at all, all at the same time, of course, okay. but she is very, very physically strong. Well, there's some people that were getting into a fight at school and she stepped in between them and broke it up and uh, teacher saw that and they decided to make her some type of goodwill ambassador and McKenzie only told me about this after the fact uh -huh. like oh dad I you know I got a new you know pencil or something like that <laughs> okay and this is me as, uh, as we're getting ready to uh, uh, do some of the uh, dirty work on me so to speak uh, that's Sean there one of the technicians and uh, I took my camera down there one day and said you guys need to maybe take a few pictures of this so we can capture this for posterity. And so what we did is we had, you see me there on the, on the table right in front of the fixed beam. Uh, and uh, that mask is designed to keep my head in exactly the same location every time we go and get a treatment done. And uh, that thing fits very tightly over the face. It's custom made. Uh, but that way, if you know exactly where the head is, they can go and send the beam in, which can be conformed to the shape of the tumor, and deliver all that energy right to the tumor. This is just another angle of that. You'll see how I'm laying there. Uh, and then the beam is coming right through that, uh, that blue block that you see. My daughter's again. And my girlfriend, Kelly. Kelly has had breast cancer, so we have a lot in common. All right, well, let's uh, talk about how this cancer, in the last couple of minutes we have, what difference has this made to you? Having cancer, what, how, how has it made a difference in your life? Well, some people, and, and I think only cancer patients probably understand this, but um, cancer can be one of the best things that's ever happened to you in your life. I know it was in mine. I, I think I was a pretty easygoing person before, but it even further helped recalibrate and helped me refocus on those things in life that truly are important. Um, it also enables me to go and speak in a meaningful way to help other people who have cancer. 
And you know, there is absolutely nothing better than helping another human being on something that matters to such a great degree. And, and, and that really is rewarding. You cannot place a monetary value on the feeling you get from doing so. What was the difference in having the cancer the second time? The first time, I think, threw me a bit harder because um, I had not been down that road before. Um, and I think I had a great deal more fear as a result. The second time, once I knew that there could be an attempt to retrieve the tumor, I had absolutely no doubt that I was going to come out the other end okay, and that I knew I would have to go through uh, a long tunnel to get to where I needed to be. Um, I knew I would have high points and low points, but there was no doubt I would come out to be uh, just fine. In fact, I did come out fine. I have uh, um, uh, recovered from uh, the treatment that I had. I play soccer again. And, uh, In fact, what happened to your finger? I know the uh, can't see well, uh, uh, Playing for the Leesburg Fire, um, we are playing a league with a lot of, of ex-college ex players, and a uh, uh, ball coming in rather hard, uh, had a parry, and uh, did myself a little injury, jammed two fingers, and in this case, I dislocated the distal joint and had a, few, a little tearing of the ligaments and the musculature. And my doctor was acting, and I guess she was trying to call me that, oh, this is you know, terrible, but we can fix this. So there, is, I, there my, is life after oh, cancer. My response to her was, oh, this is nothing. This is like a mosquito bite. <laughs> if you knew what I've been through, this is nothing. So yeah. it really helps calibrate you. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm grateful for what I've been able to go through. And I'm grateful for being able to help other people. And I mean, think of what this means. You're faced with that kind of adversity in your life. No, no, you can find your way through. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being with us here on Journey of Hope. There are people from all around the world that are watching, and I know that your story has been an encouragement to them. For Loma Linda University Medical Center and Journey of Hope, I'm Lynn Martell. For those of you that are watching, we want to encourage you to turn in next week as we interview another patient that's been impacted here at Loma Linda.